So I read about MS symptoms and it does sound like someone is being haunted. You get these tingles, you have a tight squeezing sensation on your body, you feel dizzy. You were so healthy and strong not too long ago, but now you just feel weak and you can't see out of one eye. You don't know what's wrong exactly, but you get the sinking feeling that something is definitely wrong. Of course, thankfully, we know it causes multiple sclerosis and it isn't a vengeful ghost. MS is also called the prime of life disease. Most people are diagnosed between 20 and 50 years old when so many important life milestones are happening. Whether you've just been diagnosed or you've been living with it for a while, let's talk about it. As a 20-something-year-old who had just started my life, I had just gotten married, I didn't know what the future would hold for me after an MS diagnosis. I, I thought life as I knew it was over. So the first thing I would say to someone newly diagnosed with MS is to uh, avoid Google. Don't go down you know, a rabbit hole and freak yourself out. There's a lot of misconceptions out there about MS, unfortunately. What I would say to someone that was just diagnosed with MS is your life isn't over just because you have MS. I feel like it made me stronger. It made me stronger as a human being. So most days I actually don't even think about having MS. But sometimes I do have bad days. I have to be honest, sometimes my legs are tired. They, they're just run down. Sometimes you have to take care of yourself, especially me having three kids. I have to listen to my body and sometimes tell the kids, well, not today, mommy's having a hard day, which is very hard to tell them. I knew I had to fight. I had to fight for my body. I had to fight for my kids, my family, and we're just taking it one day at a time. Welcome to Now What? Your Chronic Illness Companion. I'm Melissa Moore. We've got Augusto Mirabale, MD, FAAN, neurologist and chief of the section of MS at Rush on the line. And we're going to tell you everything you never wanted to know about MS. Dr. Mirabale, welcome. Thank you, Melissa. It's a pleasure being here. And just to kick off, do you mind telling me a little bit about what made you decide to go into neurology and specifically uh, decide to care for people with MS? Yes, absolutely. So as a student, we used to say, well, it's a fascinating field, but we don't have that many treatments to offer. As a matter of fact, there was a common stigma around neurology that they used to say is a specialty of diagnose and adios, meaning that, you know, you were able to diagnose patients with disorders, but you couldn't ultimately intervene. Well, that era is past, and, and we now have so many uh, therapies that we can offer to our patients, that therapies that truly impact the course of the disease, something that we, we know as disease-modifying therapies, which these interventions actually truly change the course and at some point stop the progression of the disease. But now we are moving also from that phase uh, to more of a preventive approach in saying, well, we don't need to wait until someone develops problems. And MS is a classic example of that. If you were to have told me, my younger, healthy self at 20-something years old, that I would have been diagnosed with an incurable illness, I would have never believed you. I was in the hospital for about three days, I think. And then uh, I like got a formal diagnosis. I got a call from, I think it was like a resident who basically was like, we think you have MS. You need to come into the hospital immediately and start steroids because you have, you know, some active lesions on your brain. We need to reduce. So Dr. Mirabale, on just a basic level, what is multiple sclerosis? So multiple sclerosis is a disease of the brain and the spinal cord that is caused by the immune system, our defenses in our body that in a sense they are confused and they are recognizing the brain as something that they need to react against. So the consequences of that interaction leads to scars in the, in the central nervous system that most of the time results in deficits or symptoms. So the cells in our body that protect us from things like a cold or the <laughs> flu, you know, instead of attacking those outside diseases, they actually start attacking our brain. Is that correct? Right. They turn against us. And that's what we call autoimmunity. The immune cells are supposed to protect us 
uh, you know, to do surveillance for cancer, for example, or to protect against infections, all of a sudden they get a wrong signal and they start attacking our own brain cells. And so you mentioned, you know, the cells in our body that are supposed to protect us attack our brain. Are they attacking a specific part of the brain? Are they attacking a specific piece of a cell in the brain? Sort of what specifically are they going after? So they're going after a component of the brain that we call myelin. And myelin is that a fatty substance that is going to wrap around the brain cells. And myelin plays a key role in the conduction and the function of these cells. So with myelin, we are able to communicate, to move, to think. I mean, every function that the brain is involved requires myelin. So it's like someone coming into our brain and, and cutting the telephone wires or coming into our brain and, and sort of smashing the cell phone towers um, and preventing communication. Yeah. That is a great analogy. I always explain, you know, if you imagine the brain as a bunch of nerves and cords and wires, myelin will be the equivalent of the plastic that surrounds those wires. And so MS is when a white blood cell comes in and with the wire cutters and just goes crazy. Yeah. So I usually explain the immune system as the police. The police is supposed to protect us. And then there is, you know, some parts of the police get confused and start chasing the civilians instead of criminals, and then that's the, the, the autoimmunity type of portion of that. So multiple scars are seen usually on an MRI, and those individuals perhaps that had an MRI and were diagnosed with MS, remember seeing those white dots on the MRI, and those are those areas of, of focal uh, sclerosis or scars. I woke up one morning and I just couldn't see out of my right eye. It was as if everything just went dark. There was no rhyme or reason to why it had happened. And I initially just started searching for answers. We didn't have any answers. And then one morning, a couple days later, I woke up and I couldn't feel my body. My arms, my legs, everything was numb. I woke up one day and the left side of my face was numb. It felt like I had a shot of Novocaine in my cheek and lower jaw area and the left side of my body just felt overall weak. I just felt like something was wrong. I started to lose vision in my left eye along with eye pain. I thought it was just a simple sinus infection, but it turned out that it was optic neuritis, which is very common with people with MS. I talked at the beginning about how MS symptoms kind of sound like a ghost is taking control of your body and they the, all these problems crop up. It seems almost random. Is there a typical progression of symptoms for someone with MS? Yeah, so the most common uh, early signs and symptoms of multiple sclerosis are usually sensory loss and numbness or loss of sensation to tactile stimulation, but also weakness and loss of vision. So those are the three most common clinical presentations. But a very common symptom that often is present prior to the diagnosis of MS is fatigue, that extreme sensation of tiredness that interferes with our activities, a fatigue that doesn't let us do the things we want to do, whether it's mental fatigue or physical fatigue. And as you mentioned earlier, so the disease usually starts in early years of life, so affects women more frequently than males. And so a typical presentation with, will be a young or middle-aged woman presenting with sudden onset of loss of vision, perhaps loss of uh, sensory function or motor function, and usually in the context of fatigue. So any of these symptoms is important to recognize and, and seek medical attention earlier. I went to two separate emergency departments um, and I was told I was too young and too healthy to have MS, but I just kept fighting for an answer. The first experience I had um, just really made me terrified for my future and, and I wanted to feel comforted and in control. So I initially met with a different academic hospital in the area and you know I was recommended to see a doctor there and I just had like a, I don't know, I just was left feeling like they didn't care for me, if that makes sense. Um, I just, I don't know, I just left, I just had a bad feeling in my stomach. As a woman who goes to the doctor, I can tell you sometimes you go to the doctor and maybe you aren't listened to as well as you should be, or someone says, you know, oh, you just need to exercise more and that problem will take care of itself. 
Can you talk about how MS in particular can be a problem uh, for getting diagnosed? You know, let's say someone does lose vision in their eye, they go to their doctor and their doctor just kind of shrugs. Can you talk about experiences that your patients have with that kind of medical gaslighting? Yeah. So unfortunately, medical gaslighting is real and we have to acknowledge that and fight it because uh, our patients often uh, share with us experiences that they had. Uh, you know, they had these symptoms clearly for years and they've been um, going through doctor's office to doctor's office before someone actually finally paid attention to the symptoms and decided to do an MRI, for example. So unfortunately, misdiagnosis occurs. And, you know, I can, I can remember a, a, a situation in which I um, was listening to a patient's story and she clearly was describing MS-related symptoms, but she was misdiagnosed for four years as having fibromyalgia or having anxiety attacks or panic attacks. Um, so this patient unfortunately lost the opportunity to access um, highly effective therapies for four years because of the lack of expertise in the physicians that were treating her at the time. If you feel like a doctor isn't listening to you as a patient, what, what are some options available to you? I think that physicians or healthcare providers play a role in medicine. And, you know, we, we have to be mindful of the fact that sometimes access to healthcare is limited. But if patients have the opportunity to seek a second opinion, I will say probably consider that particularly when you're dealing with disorders like multiple sclerosis, that is a chronic disease and you have to feel comfortable with your healthcare team. Uh, you have to establish that long lasting relationship and trust has to be a big component of that. So if you feel that perhaps uh, your physicians are not taking you seriously or, or you don't feel comfortable with the way communication occurs, maybe it's time to consider a second opinion. Is there any kind of way to predict sort of which course the disease is going to take or how much function will be preserved for how much amount of time? Sort of what's the role in predicting that outcome? I mean, like many things in medicine, sometimes when we try to predict, we are not accurate. However, uh, there is a principle that usually applies in, in MS, which is past behaviors usually predict future behaviors for the most part. So we'll look at what happened in the first few years of the disease and try to follow a trend and then understand what could happen in the next few years unless we intervene differently. Um, so we, we, we take a careful history um, and understanding, you know, even sometimes I ask questions about 20, 30 years ago to try to understand, you know, how was your life 20, 30 years ago? What can I learn from that story that may inform the practice of, you know, interventions today that hopefully will help you to continue to be stable? I initially went into action mode. I'm an action person and I seeked out neurologists who could help me. I wanted to get the best care possible, especially being a mother of three kids. I love the care that I've been getting at Rush. I love the care team there. They wanted every single detail. They were very thorough on their exam. They sent me for my MRI. They even told me what they thought, where my lesion was, and they were 100% correct on that. And they started me on steroids, and then they started a treatment plan that worked for me, which I loved. They gave me so many different options, and I weighed out the pros and cons, and I chose the best treatment for me. I go there every six months for an infusion called Aquavis, and so far I love it. And so far, I have not had any new lesions since last year, which I'm very thankful for. Can you just go into a little bit more detail about how MS is treated? MS is an autoimmune disease. So basically the immune system is the one that is recognizing myelin and, and reacting against myelin. So one of the ways that we, we treat that is by modulating those immune responses. And we have over 22 approved disease-modifying therapies that to some degree are either immune suppressants or immune modulators. And so these therapies uh, are administered either intravenous uh, with infusions or oral therapies, and we had some injectable therapies as well. So basically the way we select the right therapy for the patient is personalized. Uh, we don't follow formulas. Uh, one of the, one of the um, interesting parts of uh, being involved in the, in the care of MS patients is that we can truly personalize uh, treatments based on their individual circumstances. 
based on the MRI, based on the features that we see on the physical examination, but also on their lifestyle, based on pregnancy planning. I mean, there are so many factors that play a role into the determination of the right approach. What's sort of the wait time between when you start, you know, you, you get the intravenous or you take the pill? How long do people have to wait before they maybe see an improvement in their symptoms or they see an improvement on an MRI? Time is brain. So we, at a rush, we have a commitment that we will see patients within seven days of the requisition of a new consult for the MS group. Uh, because we recognize that early access to healthcare is what makes the difference. From that moment on, we'll make every effort to try to get patients uh, access to uh, appropriate therapies. And, and with these therapies, you can see that the mechanism of action has a, a, an almost immediate result in certain markers of inflammation. So we use the first six months uh, from the time the patients reach us at the MS clinic and, until we do an assessment to kind of identify what patterns and understanding you know, of what is happening in the first six months. For the most part, patients remain very stable. And, and depending on which therapies we decided, the expectations is that they will continue to remain stable. So getting an infusion here at Rush is just another day in the life. Um, you know, it's routine by now. It's it's my new routine, um, having MS. And once a month, I come and get my Ty Sabri medication. And I typically come in, I meet with the nurses. They make sure that I'm feeling okay, that I haven't had any major changes in my health, any new symptoms. And then they administer the medication. And honestly, while I'm getting the medication, I go about my daily life. I work, I check my email, I um, you know answer calls if I need to. I pretty much just do what I would normally do on a Tuesday morning, except I'm doing it at Rush. We don't know the cause of MS, but we are getting very close to understanding what happens, which is this combination of you know genetic factors, environmental factors, as well as uh, factors that perhaps we yet need to, to define. But what, what is occurring here is that the immune system somehow gets the signal to react against myelin. And one of the triggers uh, that is a necessary factor, but it's not a sufficient factor, is infection with a virus called Epstein Barr virus, also known as uh, the virus that causes a mono or mononucleosis infectiosa. The kissing disease, yeah. The kissing disease, right. And so what happens is this virus uh, shares some similarities in the proteins around the virus that look very similar to myelin. So the theory is that once this virus enters the, the body, some immune cells may get confused and react against these, these proteins around the virus, but also learn to react against myelin, which looks very similar. That's crazy. I, the, the idea that mono, you know, this disease you get when you're a middle schooler, or a lot of us got when we were middle schoolers, can have this lifelong effect is wild. You know, a question that I often get asked is, well, wait a minute, does mono cause MS? Well, no, no, this, this virus increases the risk of, perhaps serves as a trigger, uh, but not everyone that develops the infection will go on to develop multiple sclerosis. And I love that sort of distinction between, we know that people who have MS oftentimes have mono, but if you have mono, that doesn't necessarily mean you will get MS. Absolutely. Yes. That's, that's always important to clarify uh, so we don't we don't create panic in communities. However, uh, you know we are all hopeful that a, if and when a vaccine for mono becomes available, that will be interesting to see uh, if we can prevent the infection with mono. What well, that's going to result in a decrease or perhaps a cure of multiple sclerosis if we can eliminate that infection. So that's that's one of the areas of hopes that we have. That's so incredible to me. Vaccines are amazing. I know you mentioned environmental impacts as a cause of MS. I know that you're actually your latitude, so where you live on the earth can affect your risk factors for MS, especially, um, you know, depending on where you're born and where you live your first 15 years of life. Can you go into a little bit more detail about that? Epidemiological studies have uh, suggested for many decades now that there is a a latitudinal gradient on the incidence and prevalence of multiple sclerosis. What that means is that there are certain areas in, in the world that have a higher incidence of multiple sclerosis. 
So for example, here around the Lake Michigan is one of those areas that have a high prevalence of multiple sclerosis, but also in the Northeast region of the country and around uh, the Rockies. Um, so those are the three places that actually I trained and lived and, and practiced multiple sclerosis coincidentally. Uh, so those are locations with a, a large number of patients. Um, but this environmental uh, impact on the incidence of MS is particularly uh, important early in life. Um, so when you look at studies that measure the risk of MS and you identify other variables, for example, age, um, the environmental impact of MS is stronger earlier in life, in the first 15 years of the disease. But other factors in the environment also play a role. Uh, for example, vitamin D deficiency. Uh, vitamin D deficiency has been linked to many autoimmune disorders, but certainly with multiple sclerosis. Smoking is another factor that increases the risk of multiple sclerosis, as well as childhood obesity. So those are modifiable risk factors, and that's why it's very important to educate communities about these factors and try to mitigate them. And, you know, when we're studying who gets MS and, and asking these questions about what increases your risk or, or you know, what groups do you belong to that might indicate you have a higher risk of MS? Are there any sort of these big groups like race or ethnicity that could increase your risk? Yeah, so race and ethnicity play an important role in not only the risk of MS, but also in outcomes when someone is diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. So we know that Caucasians or whites have a higher risk of multiple sclerosis, particularly those who have, you know, Northern European ancestry. However, MS affects all races. And even though the incidence and risk is lower in Hispanics and Blacks, those ethnic groups, once they develop MS, unfortunately, they do have worse clinical outcomes. So it's very important to recognize these differences uh, and also try to approach the care in a more proactive way, particularly in those ethnic minorities and groups, because the, the clinical outcomes perhaps could be worse. Absolutely. What, if anything, today can we do to prevent MS and other brain health issues? That's a great question. And, you know, basically... The same principles that apply to multiple sclerosis apply for anything we do in life. It's what we call brain health. And now there are multiple publications that have led to an abundance of data and evidence supporting, for example, the use of nutritional strategies and diet, uh, exercise, sleep, mindfulness, stress mitigation and management. And so all of those factors play a critical role in our brain health. So whether with MS or without MS, um, those factors will certainly help. Uh, and you know we can we can go on in a two-hour discussion, which I, we don't have the time for that. Uh, but basically now it's it's refreshing to see that we can finally use this data and in a sense prescribe healthy habits uh, and individualize the care to our patients. And that's what we do here at Rush uh, with our newly uh, developed brain health clinic. I had to put myself first too, which is very important, especially when you have a family. Instead of always putting yourself last, especially as a mother, you have to put yourself first and take care of yourself. And that's what I'm doing, going to Rush and seeing the doctors every six months and getting my infusion. My biggest symptom these days is just like fatigue. So when I'm having a, a bad MS day, if you will, you know, maybe I'm a little bit more tired than usual, but I also work a lot. So like, maybe that's part of it. Can you talk a little bit more about what that uh, prescription for a healthy brain looks like and how the brain health clinic at Rush can assist patients? Yeah, so basically it's all based on a cycle of change. And the reason why we build the clinic around change is because, you know, we need to move away from simply telling to now helping patients actually make meaningful changes in their life. Um, so the, the the clinic has been created around a cycle of change in, in a way that we first start with awareness and education. So we have a robust a, a patient education program um, that consists on different uh, deliveries. We have a monthly conversations on brain health. Uh, we have a more developed curriculum called the Brain Health Program. That's a three-week brain health program that patients complete and they get a certificate on brain health. And we also have a live event that we are planning for, planning for the summer. 
so after patients complete these educational offerings, uh, they, they can enroll in the clinic. And the clinic is an opportunity for uh, individualized care. So patients meet with a nurse practitioner and, and um, Adrian Castillo, and she's going to do a, uh, an intake questionnaire on lifestyle medicine, and diet, nutrition, exercise, stress, uh, comorbidities, uh, look at hypertension, diabetes. I mean, all the factors that we know that play a critical role in brain health, and then develop a personalized plan to help patients actually address those individual uh, factors. And like any cycle of change, it's important to recognize that we might relapse, we might be in the right trajectory and some live event occurs, and then we stop exercising or we stop eating healthy. So we have plans to help patients actually re-engage with healthy lifestyle uh, strategies, even in the case of, uh, you know, unforeseeable life events. I love that. And I love that idea of, you know, going from telling patients what to do to helping them do the things they need to do. I love that approach. What is the prognosis for someone who is diagnosed with MS? Can you go into a little bit more detail about that? Yeah. So when you look at natural history studies, and with that, I mean studies that looked at patients in the past without any type of intervention. Um, those, unfortunately, studies uh, told us that patients had a decreased lifespan for approximately five to 10 years. And also uh, up to 50% of patients required uh, some degree of a uh, device for ambulation or assistance, like a cane or a walker. And 30% of patients became wheelchair bound within 15 years of diagnosis. So those are devastating outcomes. Now we can say that those outcomes are no longer true uh, when we look at how the use of medications, for example, how the use of lifestyle interventions change the prognosis of the disease. And we should expect these days that a patient that is early diagnosed with multiple sclerosis and have access to appropriate medical care should expect a normal lifetime lifespan and should expect, expect normal or near normal quality of life. Um, and that's the goal that, um, you know, nobody knows that the patient has MS unless the patient wants to disclose that. So we aim for, uh, you know, a complete remission of the disease in, in, in most individuals that actually have access to um, healthcare earlier. I know at least for people in my life who have been diagnosed with MS, it does, it can affect the whole family. Can you talk a little bit about what it's like for your patients' families uh, to have someone receive an MS diagnosis and what changes or problems or fears that you encounter? Yes, and that's a, such an important aspect of the disease. And I, I like to call partners in care as opposed to caregivers. Uh, I think the work caregivers have more of a you know, a passive connotation of saying, well, I'm going to be the person receiving the care and you're the one giving. Whereas if you talk about partners in care, that implies that every component of that team uh, is, has an active role. Um, so when, when we talk to our patients, I, I, we include uh, the partners in care very early in the disease course, whether it's spouses or family members or kids, friends. Um, and we have in part of the three-week brain health program, we have a session that we invite a patient that has MS and she's also a, a nurse practitioner and she explains how she managed to create her team around her family. And, and it's important to understand how to, in a sense, a capitalize on that valuable human resource that you have in your family in a way that ultimately they feel that they are engaged in your care and, and you, you, in a sense, feel uh, supported. Uh, but it takes some uh, learning. Uh, it takes some um, uh, discussing in terms of how do you, in a sense, deal with your family members. Naturally, everyone will want to help you. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's always good intentions behind that. But sometimes that help could become uh, as a, as a feeling like overwhelming. So it's important to help our patients navigate that situation. Um, help them assign roles in their, uh, you know, partners in care, uh, aiming to hopefully uh, have that support leading to better outcomes. There's a uh, a phrase I heard the other week that that came to mind when you were saying that, and that's help is the sunny side of control. Um, and I think that sometimes for for par for caregivers or partners in care that can kind of, that family dynamic can be very interesting to navigate. And so I think it's very important to keep, you know, the person with MS in your family is the one making decisions about their care. And the people in the family are the partners. They're not necessarily, like you said, the caregivers. Um, I love that quote. I might steal it from you, Melissa. Please do. Please do. Yeah. <laughs> Help is the sunny side of control. 
Um, That's great. What are some things that friends or family members should not do when they're helping or partnering in care with their loved one with MS? Well, that's a good question. And I don't think there is a recipe that applies to all. I mean, sure. every family is different, but certainly uh, don't get scared. Don't don't get terrified, even though the disease and the name could be intimidating. Uh, there are so many resources and things we can do for our patients that uh, fear is never helpful. Um, and another thing that I will say that they could do is uh, listen, mm-hmm. observe. It's so important to have that perspective from from someone that lives with with this with our patients every day, and sometimes their perspective uh, provides so much uh, more information um, that will allow us to kind of have a better picture of the situation. So I will say a combination between don't get scared and perhaps uh, start to learn how to listen and how to observe, and that could be extremely valuable. I love that. And I think a lot of times, you know, someone's diagnosed with MS and it's hard to deal with your own diagnosis when your your mom is also freaking out or you're dealing with your diagnosis right. and your husband is also freaking out. And, you know, someone's just gotten diagnosed. They know that maybe um, their mobility might be affected or they might have these other sort of handicapping effects of multiple sclerosis. What practical steps can people who are just diagnosed and their families take to sort of set themselves up for success? Yeah, you need a team. And that's what mm-hmm. we offer here at Rush. You need more than just a neurologist. And that's why we have uh, strong um, collaborations with physical and rehabilitation medicine, uh, physical therapists, occupational therapists, neuropsychologists. So uh, in order to provide that comprehensive care, you need a team. And I know you talked about how it's so important to have a doctor you trust, um, to have someone you feel like isn't going to gaslight you. Um, Can you talk a little bit again about why having a doctor you trust is so important for people with MS and what particular training or skills that maybe someone with MS should look for in a neurologist? Yeah, so trust is is a fundamental. It should be a, a key component of any type of relationship in healthcare. And trust is something that has to be built over time, um, but also it's it's it is critical for two reasons. One, um, patients have to feel comfortable and safe disclosing any concerns they may have that MS is impacting their lives, whether it's a you know mental health disorder, sexual life, and topics that perhaps are sensitive, and they should feel that it's a safe space to discuss those issues. But also trust is is critical because MS is very complex and the therapies that we use have very complex mechanism of actions. And it takes physicians multiple years to truly understand all the implications of these therapies. And it's extremely difficult to translate that knowledge in an hour, in in one encounter. So there's so much that patients have to trust their physicians when we make recommendations on certain therapies that it's important that 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 trust has been built um, in in, in a solid foundation. I love that. I can also remember a case of a patient that uh, her primary language was Spanish. And the the previous physician uh, only spoke English. So the amount of information that was shared during the visit was very limited. And it's not because the patient didn't want to share it, but it was limited due to linguistic barriers. Um, so at RASH, we provide bilingual care. Eh, también le permite a los pacientes sentirse más cómodos y poder... And of course, we yes. have translators for any type of language, but um, uh, we have two physicians that are certified bilingual speakers in Spanish and English. And being able to provide that history in Spanish allows for a, a more fluent conversation and perhaps for a, you know, a richer info, amount of information that is being disclosed. I can't imagine having symptoms like you have with MS where you're losing feeling, you're losing vision, and you have to try and talk in your second language or talk to someone who doesn't speak your language. That has got to be so frustrating. It is challenging. And of course, it going back to trust, I, I think that erodes at some point the ability to communicate freely and it could impact the ability to build trust over time. We have a, a commitment and it's part of our passion at the MS Center to um, develop programs that are inclusive, that uh, that serve communities and meet people where they are, regardless of their sex orientation, identification, gender, or race. And one of the ways that we got recently recognized on our efforts is that we are the only center in Chicago that 
received an award for a training fellowship in multiple sclerosis and neurodiversity. And that came as a recognition from the research that has been done by one of our faculty members, Dr. Sierra Morales, in trying to understand where are the barriers, social barriers, that have an impact in healthcare related outcomes in our patients coming from diverse uh, ethnic groups. Um, so we, we are working on a series of research projects that uh, will try to understand and mitigate those barriers. I will say that it, when it comes to patient care directly, we have to acknowledge uh, our differences. We have to acknowledge our implicit bias and, and recognize them and try to mitigate those uh, to try to be able to serve the best we can our patients with cultural humility. Absolutely. I love that idea of cultural humility when you're treating patients. Absolutely. And when you look at what doctors are, we we are we provide a service. We we are here to help patients in, in difficult moments, in difficult times. Uh, I think medical knowledge is one component of what we do, but communication is a big component. And that communication has to be open, has to be tolerant, has to disclose the fact that we uh, we accept differences. In, and again, at the end of the day, we are here to serve anyone and everyone. What would you say to someone who comes to you, you know, with an Instagram pill or an Instagram ad that they think is going to help? What What's sort of your approach to that sector of the world? Yeah, we, we need to navigate that with sensitivities because, of course, when patients go to Google and they try to find the answers to their questions, you know, that that means that they are engaged and they want to learn. So they, I always took that as an opportunity to, in a sense, reframe the conversation into what is evidence and why do we follow evidence-based practice uh, and what is the difference between data, information, and knowledge. Um, you know, we are bombarded by data and that doesn't mean that everything we read online is going to be real or evidence-based or something that we need to follow. So we, we create knowledge when we start putting pieces of data together. And, and that knowledge actually leads to healthcare literacy when we can actually navigate that amount of information and knowledge and create a, a story. And that story is based on validated or evidence-based information. So what we are trying to do here at RASH is provide those tools, provide the information that has been, in a sense, vetted and validated by the uh, scientific evidence and create those stories, those opportunities to discuss with patients a very meaningful information, whether it is in terms of nutritional strategies. What are the things that we know that has evidence? Let's, for example, say we know that trans fats are not good for the brain. So anything that increase the trans fats content, uh, anything that increase, for example, sodium content or salt. Um, we also know that, um, for example, a griffy greens and vegetables and fruit, they are good for the brain. So we, we, we have discussions on the things that actually we can support based on the evidence and things that perhaps we don't have the evidence. I love that. And I love that acceptance that someone who's looking for, for answers is an engaged patient. You know, there's someone who wants to make their health better. And just because they don't necessarily know how to do that, that's why you're there to guide them towards those, those evidence-based approaches. So comorbidities, diseases that, you know, happen at the same time, those are basically, you know, disease states that go together, right? Like they, you often see them paired up. Is that correct? Yes. And mental health affects pretty much most patients with multiple sclerosis, whether it's anxiety or, or depression or bipolar disorders. And this is not just a response to the diagnosis, but it's part of the disease itself. So I always try to take those opportunities to maybe um, ask more questions about mental health, how the disease is impacting their, their well-being overall, and whether those are coping mechanisms that we can actually help patients uh, navigate this, this diagnosis in, the, in a healthier way. And it's important to recognize that because most of the time these, these uh, mental health disorders are underdiagnosed. Um, and that's, again, uh, going back to the uh, racial ethnic uh, differences, um, you also see a pattern that certain ethnic groups have more of an issue in disclosing certain um, uh, mental health disorders. And that leads to an even um, harder, difficult time to um, diagnose them earlier and intervene. What are some other comorbidities that people with MS might experience? So uh, some patients have additional autoimmune disorders, and the classic one will be autoimmune thyroiditis or thyroid disorders. 
Um, also, we need to be mindful of, for example, diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease. Um, so those are the common ones. Uh, obesity as well. And, and, you know, not only the obesity is something that, as we mentioned before, increases the risk of multiple sclerosis, but also may lead to worse clinical outcomes and also a harder time to uh, rehabilitate in case they have uh, some sort of motor dysfunction due to multiple sclerosis patients who are living with MS long term, you know, you mentioned that before we had any medical intervention for MS, patients' lifespans were shortened by quite a bit. They often died 10 to 15 years after their diagnosis, but now people are living basically normal lives after their diagnosis. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about what it's like to live with multiple sclerosis. Do you find that most of your patients continue to work um, with MS and sort of what's your recommendation for people who are looking uh, to continue working? Yes, I always encourage patients to remain in the workforce for many reasons. I think, uh, I think the cognitive stimulation that comes with a with a, a work environment, it's beneficial to multiple sclerosis. Of course, we have to be mindful of stress and how chronic stress perhaps may affect. Um, their their participation in, in society, uh, but certainly being uh, cognitive stimulated uh, helps. Uh, also financially, uh, MS could be a very costly disease, um, anywhere from the therapies, but also from the ancillary uh, services that may require. So in a sense, having access to healthcare, it's also important. Uh, but we, we provide a, a assessment in terms of uh, work placement in, in our patients. We help a patients um, navigate the process of uh, requesting disability services in case they, they need that. Um, but I, I, I try to always encourage patients to remain in the workforce and in, if any, perhaps uh, request special accommodations if needed. Absolutely. Um, and do you find that your patients face stigma or shame related to their MS? You know, I, I know that this can be an invisible illness. You know, you may not be able to tell someone has MS by looking at them, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes people use a cane or a wheelchair. Can you talk a little bit about the stigma around MS? Yeah, stigma exists, unfortunately. And that's another area that we were talking before about trust and being having a trustworthy conversation with your healthcare provider about the things goes a long way. Um, we we, we want to help. And, and if, if stigma is on the way of you accomplishing good quality of life, then we, we can discuss that and help you navigate that difficult situation. Um, some patients, for example, choose not to disclose multiple sclerosis out of fear. Um, some patients uh, take the opposite and they, they not only disclose that they have MS, but they create you know, social groups or they go to social media and create uh, some sort of a campaign for awareness. And I think every response is, could be healthy um, depending on how we approach that. So I know that multiple sclerosis for a long time was a very mysterious disease to us. And, and thankfully, you know, we've had these advances in technology that have allowed us to understand the disease. What is still mysterious about MS? What keeps you up at night? I think the number one uh, area that I keeps me awake at night is why we cannot repair, why we cannot remyelinate. What are the mechanisms that will allow our patients to start creating cells again that will take over the function of the cells that perhaps were damaged with multiple sclerosis? So there is a lot of interest in the next chapter of MS therapies being, you know, can we repair, can we restore the function of the brain through medical interventions or perhaps, you know, behavioral interventions. That is my Roman Empire. So most days I actually don't even think about having MS. Uh, I'm, I'm lucky on that front, right? I, I caught M my MS early um, and I, you know, started treatment immediately after diagnosis. I've been on, you know, the highest efficacy treatment since. Yeah, so most days I'm lucky enough where I, I don't even like think about having MS, right? Which is pretty awesome. What I would say to someone that was just diagnosed is that your life is not over. It just might be a, just like a little bump in the road, but you can still do things. Always put yourself first and just take care of yourself. Listen to your body. If you're having a good day, sure. Go do that workout. Go take that walk around the neighborhood. If you're having a bad day, rest, listen to your body. 
or if you're sensitive to heat or even the cold, stay out of it. Take care of yourself. That's all I can say. We've covered a lot of ground today. We've talked about a lot from diagnosis to treatment, prevention, you know, what's in the future for MS. If there's one thing you wanted someone to take away from this podcast, what would it be? That MS is, is a treatable disease. We have a lot of ways that we can help our patients, even though it might feel intimidating at first to have a, a diagnosis of a chronic illness, one that we don't have a cure. There are so many things we can do to help our patients, and it's reasonable to expect a, a normal quality of life. Thank you again to Dr. Mirabale for your wonderful conversation today. And if you've made it this far, dear listener, thank you so much for joining us. Whether you've just been diagnosed with MS, you've been living with it for a long time, or you're someone who loves someone with MS, I hope you feel more informed and empowered to answer, now what?